Hello. Today, my presentation is on imaging assessment to guide patient selection and intervention for mitral valve and valve procedure. Here are my disclosures. So why do we do mitral valve and valve? Well, it avoids a reoperation. And if the patient has previous cabbage or aortic valve replacement, it's going to have more difficult surgical exposure with reoperation. Also, you avoid excavating the old mitral prosthesis, which can risk injuring the atrial ventricular group. Of course, if you have a percutaneous procedure, it reduces morbidities and potential mortality. And finally, now it's mostly a transeptal procedure, percutaneous, you can see immediate hemodynamic improvement and possibly next day discharge. So in the TBT registry in the United States, you can see that the number of transcaptor mitral valve replacement, TMVR, mostly of them will be mitral valve involved is increasing for the last several years. And you can see the mean DN age is around in the mid 70s. But well, what are the outcomes of mitral valve involved? You can see this is a comparison, small study of single center looking at reoperation versus mitral valve involved replacement. You can see there were no difference in mortality at one year. And you can see that the TMBR group, a sicker patient with higher STS score, shorter length of stay, shorter ICU stay, less AFib, but there were a higher mitral valve gradient at one year. Now, what about the entire United States? You can see this is the entire United States experience with mitral valve and valve. And you can see certainly transeptal is a default approach down because the mortality of one year is much lower than transapical. And you can see that here, 30 outcomes with transeptal is very safe, 5% mortality, 1% stroke, almost no reintervention, very low pacemaker rate. And this is sustained at one year. You can see with the all cause mortality only 16%, 3% stroke, almost no reintervention, no pace, very little pacemaker and very little device thrombosis. Now, we do have some long-term outcomes. This is the mitral trial led by Myra Guerrero that I was part of. There are 30 patients in this arm of mitral valve and valve, and you can see that the survival of five years is quite good, 80, nearly 80% compared to valve and ring or valve and MAC. And you can see the gradient is sustained at around a little bit over six millimeters of mercury. And you can see that most of the patients uh, have mild uh, or less MR. Uh, you can, and so it is, a durable procedure, at least for five years. Now, when would you do re-op mitral valve replacement? Because not everyone is going to be for mitral valve and valve candidate. Well, number one, if you have significant PVL that is not amenable to percutaneous closure, if you have endocarditis, if you have LVO obstruction uh, risk that cannot be treated percutaneously, and finally, if you need combined surgery, just a tricuspid valve repair, cabbage, or maze procedure. So let's look at the valve, prosthetic valve anatomy, if you're not familiar with, with it. So there's the valve leaflet A, there's the stand frame B, and there's the external sewing ring C. However, you can see that the stand internal diameter of stand ID is very different from the label size and also very different from the true ID because as you can imagine, the leaflets itself takes up space. So depending on the mechanism of failure or whether it's bovine or porcine valve, there's a little bit of thickening uh, in the leaflet that can reduce the internal orifice area. So the set internal dimensions of a surgical mitral prosthesis uh, is quite relevant in terms of valve and valve. And with most of them being standard valve, these diameters are much smaller uh, than the label size, especially for porcine valve. So let's take a look at this example here. You can see that at this particular measurement, the internal diameter is only around 24 millimeters but it could actually be a 27 millimeter surgical valve. Now there's been a lot of discussion on CT sizing and analysis to determine TMVR procedure. This is an excellent uh, paper summarizing the workup, but there are sizing caveats with CT because of motion artifact, blooming artifact, there's contrast of washout and shadowing. Remember some of these valves are non-planar, so it'd be a non-planar tracing is a projected uh, diameter and circumference. You can also imagine not all of them are visible in terms of at the end of the sewing ring, such as the Medtronic Mosaic Valve or the St. Jude Epic Valve. And finally, as I mentioned before, the leaflet thickening is not accounted for. So you can see that here, 
This is a transesophageal echo looking at the bilateral bowel prosthesis. So that's an important evaluation. However, they are sizing caveats for TEE. First of all, it's 2D versus 3D. Uh, it is dependent on the imager. There's also a blooming artifact, and there's risk of underestimating the true diameter. So Vini Bapai, my colleague, has developed a valve, mitral valve in valve app, and I encourage you to download that for free. You can look at all the sizing with valve in valve and also valve in ring. And of course, it's not as simple as that because you can see each valve prosthesis on the mitral position is different. So you need to look at each individual valve separately. And here's the workflow. You pick the valve, and then you look at the internal uh, the label size, and then tell you the internal diameter of the stand ID. And a true internal diameter, you can see in this particular case, it's even smaller than the stand ID, and then the recommended uh, transcapital valve, which in this case right now is a balloon expandable valve, and in the United States, it's only Edward Sapien III. So how do you position these? Remember, the valve for showing from the atrial to the ventricle, not, not the other way around, unlike Tauber. So you have to make sure your outflow, meaning the ventricular side, is parked properly so that when you deploy the valve and the valve for showing in the atrial direction, that it's not going to push the valve forward and embolize into the ventricle. So in terms of the positioning, it's very important. And we usually recommend an 80% ventricular deployment to allow the, the uh, stable anchor and atrial foreshortening. Now, there are some challenges associated with optimized sizing. The question is, do you oversize to avoid embolization or migration? Or can you true size and perhaps optimize the expansion because the CT scan does not account for the leaflet thickening? And what about the mechanism fa failure? So I would say that if you have stenotic valve with very thick leaflets, calcified leaflets, I think less oversizing would be reasonable uh, to anchor, but you have pure regurgitation that I would recommend more oversizing to avoid any risk of migration. So here you certainly, we can see that here, this is the old days with the Sapien uh, XT. And you can see that, you know, it looks okay, but it's a short valve and you do not see any ventricular flare. And then afterwards you see the dramatic effect of tumbling uh, in the left atrium, which can be a cat catastrophic. And you can see that here, this is an old sapien valve, and you can see that when you deploy here, it's parallel, but then afterwards you can risk migration, and you can see that here, with the systolic contraction, uh, you can, now the valve is at risk of embolization. So, because the higher closing pressure, other than the uh, opposite of diastolic pressure in the tower side, we would ideally like to flare a little bit on the ventricular side, which uh, gives you a more cork effect to avoid migration and embolization. And with sapien free being taller about, actually it makes it a little easier. Now, what about orientation? Uh, should you align the commissure to commissure? Well, technically you, you cannot do that with this uh, technology and this procedure right now. However, what can you do uh, is that if you actually intentionally misalign, because the leaflets can flare more rather than the commercial post resisting it, uh, you may be able to get a better uh, cork effect uh, with the deployment. Neo LVOT certainly is extremely critical uh, in terms of assessment, in terms of LVOT obstruction, whether it's feasible or not for mitral valve in valve, because the prosthetic mitral valve leaflet would be occlusive to creating a cylinder effect against the Sapien 3, a balloon expandable valve. And you can see these are some of the risk factors. In this particular case, they don't have anterior leaflet anymore, so that's less concern. But certainly the prosthetic valve leaflet's important, the aorta mitral angle, prominent septal hypertrophy, how much you flare out the uh, ventricular side of the valve, and also in terms of some of the other dimensions. But of course, make a note that porcine mitral valve are different from bovine mitral valve. You can see that here, with the porcine valve, because the leaflets are shorter, your actually neo LVOT might be bigger than you think. Of course, with the CT analysis, we tend to be more conservative and we measure a neo LVOT all the way down to the bottom of the strut pulse or commissural pulse. And of course, with the bovine pericardial valve, you can see that here it goes all the way to the bottom of the commissural pulse. So certainly uh, the neo LVOT would be smaller than that of the porcine valve. Now, what about residual stenosis? This is from the Vivid Registry. And you can see that here, there is a risk of residual stenosis as you've shown in the previous uh, studies that at one year, there's higher gradient in the prosthetic mitral valve in valve. 
uh, versus reoperation. And you can see that here, especially some of them are even at the mean grade and over 10. And you can see that especially with the small surgical valve and small uh, transcatheter valve being put in, there's a higher risk of residual gradient, uh, mean grade gradient, or equal to 10. And this can lead to potential prosthesis patient mismatch in mitral valve and valve. Uh, it's less studied compared to TAVR, obviously, and most of the mitral valve prosthesis can be large. Uh, and of course, they open with lower pressures. So the question is, can you actually fracture and modify the uh, prosthetic mitral valve? The answer is yes, and depends on the prosthesis that you uh, uh, in the patient. However, you will need to have high pressure and you can actually risk AV groove disruption. And you'll need to use balloon uh, to fracture that is larger than the stent ID. And of course, we know that the bigger balloon we've had in the market available right now is 28. And so not every valve can be fractured. However, most of the issues tend to be in the most smaller surgical valves such as 25 millimeter, which is the smallest mitral prosthesis. Um, and even 27 can be small with the smaller internal diameter, particularly with porcine valves. So those valves can be considered to be fractured. Uh, and of course, if you want to fracture a larger valve, it's not really feasible. So what you can do is post dilate to optimize the expansion and the hemodynamics. You can see that here, this is a mitral valve in valve. Uh, in a 25 epic, it's a 23 valve. You can see them with 23 and a 25 epic. That's a way, so certainly it would be risk underexpanded. And in, initial gradient was 11, but now you can see that here with true balloon stretching the valve more, you're not really fracturing per se, uh, you actually can reduce the gradient afterwards. But of course, you have to be mindful of risk of injuring the, the sapien free valve leaflets. Now, you can see that here, one of the concerns is that if you underexpand it, like in this particular CT scan on the right side, uh, with a waist, you can risk increasing halt and decreasing durability with these patients. And when you saw that the average age of these patients in the 70s, the durability certainly, I think, would be relevant. Of course, there are three ways to deliver the mitral valve and valve, the most common being transeptal. Uh, rarely now we do transapical. Of course, if you have open uh, hybrid procedure, you can consider transatrial directly as well. This uh, review paper by Mark Burrow is excellent in terms of a step-by-step -step guide. And you can see there's the equipment that's necessary to do this procedure safely. And of course, with TMR, uh, you don't need, it's different from mitral clip in terms of puncture. What you want is more inferior, posterior rather than uh, mid or superior. The reason being that if you do superior, you can actually end up uh, having an anterior bias and you don't have a direct trajectory to the prosthesis. And as a result of that, you can actually struggle to cross into the valve from the left, right atrium to the left atrium. Also, the ITO puncture height is not that high. You don't need to be very high, but you do need to be at least 2.5 to account for the balloon length of the uh, sapiens uh, free system. And so that's how what I mean by that. And also you need to have an optimal wire trajectory as I seen here, the free shaped wire should be the curve should be facing bottom, not, not up. And also you can see the balloon uh, subtosomy is important to allow the delivery system and about the track to the left atrium. And you can see that this curve should be in a nice curve instead of bending up and down and wrapping around the left atrium, which I'll show you a case a little bit later, how that happened. Now in terms of balloon septosomy, I would say that from the 23 to 26, usually 10 to 12 millimeter balloon is sufficient, depending on the compliance of the septum. And with the 29, we typically go up to even 20, 14 millimeters to allow the larger valve to cross in the septum without getting stuck. Uh, the orientation you have to check, this is like an anti-gray approach, the transapical and residual ASD. We typically don't close it unless there's significant shunting. We typically like to anticoagulate these patients for three months, similar to what we do with the standard uh, surgical uh, mitral valve replacement, and then afterwards a uh, baby aspirin. So let me show you a case. This is a 59-year-old female, very young, but high STS score, period is 27 millimeter paramount mitral valve replacement, and then had multiple complications. Now, uh, severe COPD and home oxygen, pulmonary hypertension, and frail. And you can see this patient actually have a normal ejection fraction with elevated pulmonary pressures. The patient actually makes mitral prosthesis, stenosis, and regurgitation you see here on echo. Now, the issue is that the new LVOT is rather small. You can see that it's almost greater than 50% reduction. Uh, and so the concern is that with her body habitus, is that going to be a problem with uh, prosthesis patient mismatch, number one, and number two, also LVOT obstruction. 
So this is the app. You can see that here, technically, you need to go a 26 or 29 millimeter safety in free valve. And you can see a Neo LVOD here. Uh, originally, it's quite big, over 300 millimeter square. But now, after mitral valve mount, you potentially reduce it down to less than 150 millimeter square. What the, the literature recommend is at least 200 millimeter square or more. Uh, so this is certainly a worrisome. And you can see that the septum is not very thick. Uh, so what we decided to do is use a 26 millimeter valve instead of 29. And what we have to do, you can see that here to avoid LVO2 obstruction, we have a bailout with a pigtail on the left ventricle in case we have to exchange for mechanical support, such as an impeller or cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, and we would do a septal alcohol ablation uh, to reduce the LVOT gradient if we need to. So you can see this is a case where we did not puncture more inferiorly. And as a result, you have to wrap all the way around the left atrium deliver valve. This is not what we would recommend. We don't do this anymore. In fact, uh, this is not the ideal approach. So you can see that actually we were able to uh, deliver this valve successfully, no migration embolization, acute improvement in pulmonary pressure and left atrial pressure. The patient went home in seven days. Uh, and you can see an echo follow up. There were no uh, PBR, no amount with a very low gradient and no LVOT uh, gradient. In fact, you can see that here at 30 day, there's no turbulence across the new LVOT. And the new LVOT, despite what looks very ominous on CT, uh, was actually quite acceptable. And you can see the valve, uh, despite being a 26 millimeter, is quite well expanded without a significant waste. However, we do see a little bit of flare on the ventricular side. So I think the risk of this migrating longer term will be uh, less likely than if we were not flare on the ventricular side. Now, because of the fluoroscopic landmark with mitral valve in valve, you might not need TEE actually if there's contraindication or you uh, patient cannot tolerate it. You can see this is a case series from Cleveland Clinic looking at 2D ice guided transeptal puncture, then proceed with doing a mitral valve in valve procedure as you see here. In fact, they can even do a 4D, 3D ice uh, guided mitral valve in valve under constant sedation. You can see that here, the uh, 3D ice catheter, you can use it for transeptal access and even evaluating the mitral valve prosthesis because the 3D ice now have five uh, plane and 3D reconstruction and you can deploy the valve fluoroscopically. Now, if there's LVOT obstruction, the technique to have to leave modification is called tip to base lampoon. You can see that here, you basically traverse through the tip of the leaf and you pull the flying V towards the sewing ring of the annulus of the prosthetic valve that gives you a more predictable laceration. Now, if you cannot do that and you have to do it for open heart surgery and you have other concomitant surgery, you can actually directly implant a sapien valve through the prosthesis uh, itself. What you do is you resect the prosthetic valve leaflet because obviously you don't want LVOT obstruction with that. And also we have better washout because you technically don't need the leaflets to anchor. And so you just need the sewing ring to anchor and you can just deploy the valve under direct vision. And we've done that in the past in patients who we don't want to explain the uh, surgical valve. And because there's no leaflet in this place, you actually can optimize the expansion of the safe and free valve itself inside the prosthesis. So in summary, transcaptor mitral valve in valve is a less invasive alternative to re MVR. It's becoming a new standard now with people five-year outcomes. Pre-case planning is critical to evaluate for expanded valve, valve sizing and LVOT obstruction risk. A TE can evaluate failure mechanism. However, the procedure still can be done with TE or ICE and floor guidance for implantation. So true size and optimizing the expansion of the balloon expandable valve, I think, may avoid leaf a pin drilling and reduce the mitral valve gradient and possibly promote long-term durability. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.